I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. I'm going to explain to you quickly what Palm Sunday is all about. It is the fulfillment of a prophecy in Zechariah. Luke chapter 19, and I'm going to start reading with verse 29. It's on the screen here behind me in case you didn't bring your Bible today. When he drew near to Beth Page and, and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet set. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You will say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it, those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. Verse, city, verse 36, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, in another uh, scripture, it says that they actually waved palm branches and they laid palm branches in the way. Whenever you see palms, palm branches, that is a symbol of praise. That's why it's so powerful when you lift your palms to heaven. That's a symbol of praise. When you wave your palms to heaven, that's a symbol of praise. And what they were doing was they were declaring that the king was coming in to the city, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 39 some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones or the rocks would cry out. Yeah. Will you do me a favor? Will you touch about five people around you and tell them, Ain't no rock going to get my praise. Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful for this day, a day of praise. We remember how you rode into Jerusalem on this day. We know what's going to happen at the latter part of this week. You're going to give your life for us, but in three days, you will rise again, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And because you live, we shall live also. I pray that your anointing would saturate this room. Let every mind be alert and every heart be receptive to receive this word is my prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now, before we get into this, I want to talk a little bit about praise. And I want to tell you something about praise. Your praise is powerful. Did you know that? Your praise is powerful. Don't ever waste your praise because your praise is powerful. And there are some things that happen when we begin to praise God. And I, I want to give you these real quick. If you want to take notes, this is a great place to take notes. Because a couple things happen when we praise God. Number one, praise magnifies God. Yep. Magnifies God. When you as a kid, did you ever play with a magnifying glass? Did you ever light ants on fire? I did. <laughs> I still do that. I'm teaching Sage how to do that. If you've ever played with a magnifying glass, and you've ever looked through a magnifying glass, you look through it, and whatever the magnifying glass is focused on becomes bigger. When you move the magnifying glass, you see that it wasn't the object that changed size, but rather your perception of the object that changed size. Now, David says in the Psalms, oh, magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. Now, how, David, let me ask you a question, Mr. David, how can you make a God bigger who is already limitless in his size? How 
can you increase the size of a God who the Bible says heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool and he beholds us like grasshoppers? How do you enlarge God? Well, the truth is you can't make a God without limitation any bigger than he already is. But David was not saying to make God bigger. What he was saying, make your vision of God bigger. Make God bigger in your life. When you begin to praise God, God doesn't change in size, but your focus and your vision of God begins to increase in size. So when you're standing in front of a mountain, don't look at the mountain. Don't go to God and tell God how big your mountain is. Look at the mountain and tell him how big your God is. Change your view, your perception of who God is. Praise puts our focus on God, not on our problems. It puts your focus on God's power, God's presence, and God's ability to transform whatever it is you're facing. Here's another thing praise does. Praise humbles us. It humbles us. Praise has the ability to humble us. Let me explain this. I am not a good flyer. I never get closer to God than when I'm flying because I do more praying during those few hours than I do at any other point in my life. Whenever I'm going to get on a plane, I, I, I suffer extreme anxiety about flying. And, and with the plane crash this week, that didn't help me at all. I, I'm just, and I'm watching all the news reports about how unsafe planes are. And I'm thinking, oh, dear Jesus, I'm taking a bus back home when I leave Florida. I, I just, I get this terrible anxiety when it comes to flying. And I was in the airport. We're getting ready to get on the plane to come home. And I started praying, God, take this anxiety from me. Take this anxiety from me. And God spoke to me. And he said, why is it that you don't have anxiety about anything else? You can get on the tallest, fastest roller coaster in the world. And you're good with that. But getting on a plane, which is the safest form of travel, that freaks you out. Could it be that you have confidence, you have no anxiety when you are in a situation that you feel like you can control. But the moment you're in a situation that you have no control over, you get fearful. Maybe the problem isn't me not taking fear from you. Maybe the problem is you don't trust me when you get into a place that you can't control. And so I stopped praying, God, take the fear from me. And I started just praising God. And praise humbled me and praise taught me that there are going to be times in my life when I can't control the outcome of the situation. But I know the one who can. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds my tomorrow. Here's another thing, praise. What happens when we praise? Praise reveals our devotion to God. If you love Christ, you will praise him. Not because you're told to. Not because it's that part of the song. If you love Jesus Christ, you are going to praise him. It goes all the way back to that old song we used to sing. You don't have, look, look, you don't need a message on praise. You don't need the, the 15 points theologically of why we should praise God. If you just go back to the old song that says, when I think about the Lord and how he saved me and how he raised me and how he filled me with the Holy Ghost and how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. If you've ever had an encounter with Christ, ain't nobody got to tell you to praise him. Another thing praise will do, praise motivates us to holy living. It motivates us to holy living. What do I mean by this? Well, next time you are tempted to sin, you know, cuss the person out in the car next to you. Sleep with somebody that ain't your wife and ain't your husband. Next time you're tempted to do that, I dare you just to stop and start praising God and see if that doesn't suck the romance right out of the room. Brothers, when she's enticing you, 
to come lay with her. That's King James Version. When she's enticing you to come lay with her, just fall on your knees and say, Lord, I thank you because you're a good God. See, whatever you praise, you become. Whatever you worship, you become. When you begin to worship God, you become more like God. You pick up the attributes of God, the characteristics of God. So praise motivates us to holy living. Another thing praise does happens when we praise. Praise increases our joy. It's real tough to be sad and praise at the same time. In fact, I just want you to turn and smile at the person next to you. Just smile real big. Just real big. Doesn't that feel good? Joy is contagious. And a lot of people say when they come into City Gate, man, this is a happy place. You know why? Because it's a praising place. This is a praising place. And all through the Word of God, you will find joy linked to praise. Whenever somebody's praising, joy is linked to praise. So if you're in this room today and you feel depressed, you feel discouraged, you even feel fearful, praising God will bring you joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. It's a joy that the world can't give and a world can't take away. I heard about this doctor. He did a study on people who jump on trampolines. He put some uh, patients on trampolines that, that were suffering from depression. And he started having them just jump on trampolines. Do you know what he found out? The more they jumped, there was a chemical that was released in their brain that ran all through their body and back up into their brain and made them happy just from jumping. You wonder why in that moment in the song everybody started jumping? It's because there's some people that need joy in this room. You jump for a little bit, you'll get happy eventually. Luke chapter 10, verse 20, here's what Jesus said, nevertheless... Do not rejoice at this, he's talking to his disciples, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, in that hour, the Bible says, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit. Greek, the Greek word here is a combination of words, agon and agalio. Agon means much, and agalio means jumping. So here's the disciples. They're excited because they could cast out devils, and Jesus said, that ain't nothing worth getting excited about. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, and in fact, I kicked him out by my pinky finger. Having power over a devil ain't nothing to get excited about. But then Jesus started jumping. He said, if you're going to get excited about anything, fellas, get excited about you were lost in your sins with no way out, destined for a devil's hell. But when I go to the cross and rise again, I'm going to give you the opportunity to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. If you're going to get excited about anything, get excited that you're on your way to heaven when that's worth jumping about. Praise God, if I had an organ, you'd all be jumping right now. (laughs) Praise establishes our faith. Praise creates an atmosphere that fear can't survive in and doubt can't survive in and sickness can't survive in, and worry can't survive in. Praise creates an atmosphere that these things that are in your life have to get out of your life. Do you remember what the Bible said? That that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Not only was he talking about angels bowing, not only was he talking about us bowing, but he was talking about every demonic principality coming against your life, 
when you begin to name the name Jesus and give glory to the name of Jesus, sickness has to bow its knee at the name of Jesus. Fear has to bow its knee at the name of Jesus. Somebody just shout Jesus in this room. Shout Jesus in this room. Now praise that name, Jesus. Luke chapter 19, verse 36, the second half of the verse, part B. The Bible says the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice. There's that word. They started jumping. And praise God with a quiet voice. Because we're reformed Christians. We're educated Christians. We don't get loud in churches. There's no point to getting loud. In... No, the Bible says when they started jumping and the next thing you know, they got loud. I wish somebody would get loud up in this house. I... Oh, just take about 20 seconds and get, get loud. High five somebody and say, come on, let's get loud. Let's get loud. Let's get loud. We got something to get loud about. What cause and effect? The effect is they're getting loud and they're rejoicing. What is the cause? Because this multitude of disciples, they were getting loud because of what they had seen. They had seen things that you can't explain away. They had seen things, and I can see Peter holding on to the rope, leading that donkey down the street. And I can see Peter just doing one of these things. Well, it's a, oh, thank you, Jesus. Sorry, sorry, Master. We'll get it. Oh, oh, sorry, where's that donkey at? You ever had one of those moments? You ever had a moment where a praise just hits you at an inconvenient moment? I mean, you're trying to talk to somebody and then, whoop. There's always a shh comes after it. Just trying to carry on a conversation. Whoop. Thank you, Jesus. Well, ma'am, do you want to supersize that or not? Give me a second. And people think you're strange. They think there's something wrong with you. It's hard to hold your composure when you've seen some stuff. It's hard for me to hold my composure when I see 35 teenagers run down and get delivered from a spirit of suicide. It... It's hard for me to hold it together when I've seen God save people strung out on drugs with no hope, but he saved them to the bone. It's hard for me to stand here and hold my composure when I've seen him heal people. Has anybody seen some stuff up in this room? Tell somebody, if you'd have seen what I saw, you'd be acting like I'm acting. (laughs) Come on, if you've ever seen anything, give them a praise right now. If you've ever seen them turn somebody's life around, give them a praise right now. If you've ever seen them make a way where there was no way, give them a praise. That might just hit you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 39. 
And some of the Pharisees in the crowd, religious people, they're always in every crowd. Even if you got a praising crowd, there's going to be a few Pharisees in that crowd. And they said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Now, that's the nice King James version for saying, tell them to shut up. Tell them to shut up. They're disturbing us. They're causing a commotion. It's not necessary to get that loud. It's not necessary to act like that. But you know what I find fascinating? Is Pharisees never show up at football games. I was watching the UK game last night. Now, I know I should have been praying, but I was. I was watching and praying. Amen. That's what Jesus told me to do. He said, watch and pray. That's what I did. I did not see anyone in that entire game stand up and say, now this shouting is ridiculous. People taking their shirts off, painting letters on their chest. Well, that's just ridiculous. There's no need to act like that. There's no need to jump like that. There's no need to high five everybody like that. And that's just a game. Let me tell you Pharisees something. This ain't a game what we're doing in here. This is life or death. And when you've seen what I've seen and heard what I've heard and experienced what I've experienced, if they can shout for a basketball, I can shout for a God who saved me, healed me, empowered me. And Jesus, and Jesus says, I tell you, if these were silent, the praisers, if the praisers got quiet, the very rocks would begin to cry out. Jesus was not talking to people who weren't saved, who didn't know the Bible, that that weren't religious. These were Pharisees. They knew the scriptures. And can I tell you, they understood and they had to memorize the entire book of Psalms. They knew every Psalm that David had written. They knew the Psalm that says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. They knew that. They knew I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. They knew that. They knew bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. They knew that. They knew. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him on the instruments. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. I got good news for you today. If you're not breathing, you don't have to praise him. Because the Bible said the dead don't praise the Lord. But take a deep breath in. Now when you let it out, let it be praise. Go ahead. Let it be praise. Let it be praise. Let it be praise. Let everything that has breath, let everything that has breath, let everything that has, let everyone whose lungs are expanding and contracting, praise the Lord. I tell you that if these who have the actual breath of God on the inside of them stop praising, then the things that have no breath in them whatsoever will take their place. 
In other words, here's what he's saying. If you who were created to praise, stop praising, then the thing that was not created to praise will start praising. And it makes more sense for a rock that was not created to praise to praise than it does for a human being who was created to praise not to praise. And they knew that. And I began to wonder, what if one Sunday, maybe even this Sunday, what if all the praise stopped? In churches meeting in schools, in cathedrals, churches meeting in storefronts or in coliseums, what if for one moment all the praise stopped? The pastors took the podium and said, stop, we're not praising today. Don't anybody say amen. Don't anybody say hallelujah. Don't anybody say praise Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No, not today. I wonder what would happen all over this world. If we could transport ourselves over to a desert in the Middle East... I believe that if all the praise stopped just for one day, you might hear this one rock out in the middle of a desert wasteland. But you would hear it begin to say something. And we move closer and we hear what this rock is saying. And it's saying, praise him because he provides. What? Praise him because he provides. Now, Mr. Rock, what do you mean praise him? Because he's, tell me your story. And I could hear this rock saying, well, one day I was out here minding my own business, just enjoying the nice sunshine like I do every day. When there was this large group of people, grumbling and complaining people, that came and camped around me. And they were all mad at this one man who had a stick in his hand. Now they had talked about miracles that had been performed in the past, but nothing was good enough. And now they were saying, God has brought us out here to the desert to die of thirst. And I saw the man with the stick. He turned aside and he knelt down and he began to pray. And I think he had had all he could have with these people. Because he stood up and he turned around and he said, Shall we fetch water for you from this rock? And he took his stick and he bonked me on the head. Now, mister, I didn't do anything to you. Why in the world are you taking your stick and hitting me? And all of a sudden, I felt something begin to stir on the inside of me. It began bubbling up like a fountain. And before I knew it, I cracked open and there was a fountain of living water that came shooting out from me, an old dry rock, and water came shooting forth from me. I'm telling you that he's a God who provides. Even if you're in a desert, he's a God who provides. Even if it looks like there's no hope and no help, he's a God. But you know what? Moses was never supposed to hit that old rock. He was supposed to speak to it. Moses was disobeying when he struck that rock. But God gave him provision anyways. See, that's what I love about this story. Because this story tells me that there have been times in my life where God has provided for me even when I didn't deserve it. I wonder if anybody could take just about 10 seconds and give God an I didn't deserve it praise. Even when I messed up, he still showed up. How many miracles have you received that you didn't deserve a one of them? You know what, the devil's gonna show up And he's going to tell you, don't you praise. 
You don't, you're not worthy. You don't deserve that. You don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve to be doing what you're doing. You, don't, you, you need to look at the devil and say, you know what? For the first time in your life, you told the truth. I don't deserve anything that God has given to me, but it was his grace and mercy on my life that provided for me. Even when I was in the wrong place, even when I was living in disobedience, even when I was a sinner. Woo! Tell somebody, you ever got anything you didn't deserve? It goes back to an old song. Your grace and mercy has brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. So I want to praise you and thank you too because your grace and mercy has brought me through. No praise. No praise. Do you hear that? I hear something else. (laughs) Well, these are just little guys. (laughs) I hear them saying something. What are you saying, buddy? (laughs) What? Praise him? Because he's bigger? Well, you're just a little guy. It doesn't matter. Praise him because he's bigger. What's your story? Well, you know, one day, me and my four brothers were taking a swim in the creek. And we were enjoying our time in the creek when this little boy came by. And he reached in and he took my four brothers and put them in a bag. And then he reached in and grabbed me. But he didn't put me in the bag with my four brothers. He put me in a little sling. And I heard a giant say, Am I a dog that you come with me and send a little boy out to fight me? I'm going to feed your body to the birds. And I hear this little boy say, you come at me with a sword and a shield, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. And he started spinning me around and around and he let me go and I landed in the middle of that giant's forehead and he fell flat on his face. I'm telling you to praise him cause he's bigger than any giant that's in your life. I said he's bigger than any giant that's threatening you, that's telling you to back up. God is bigger. Here's what God put in my heart to tell somebody. But you've been covered up. You've been under the water. You've been seeming like all you can do is wake up one day, you're in a storm, you go to bed at night, you're in a storm, you just feel like your life is in the middle of a flood and you pray and you say, God, take me out of this, but God doesn't take you out of it. He leaves you in it. Why is he leaving you in it? Because he knows that that storm is removing the rough edges off of your life. See, if he threw you while you still had rough edges, you'd fly off course. You'd go over here. You'd go over there. But if he leaves you under the water long enough, it begins to smooth you out. And when you get just to perfection, God reaches in, puts his hand on your life, and then he slings you into your destiny, and he puts you right where you are always supposed to be. I've come to tell somebody, you're not in a flood by accident. You're not in a storm by accident. God is perfecting you because when he perfects you, he's going to let you go. Somebody praise him because he's bigger. Woo! High five somebody and say he's bigger than any mountain that I can or cannot see. I didn't even plan on this one. (laughs) But I heard another rock, another little guy. And he said one day, he's saying, praise him, praise him. 
praise him because he shuts the mouth of your enemies. But what do you mean? One day these men came by and they had this lady with them. And they said they had called her in sin and they threw her down at the feet of this man called Jesus. And they ran over and they started grabbing me and they, they started grabbing some of my friends and, and they picked up stones. And, and these stones are saying praise him because he shuts the mouth of your accuser. Well, what do you mean he shuts the mouth of your accuser? Well, you see, when they picked up stones and they brought her to Jesus, they said, Lord, according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned because we caught her in her sin. But this man, Jesus, didn't say a word. He just reached down and started drawing in the dirt. And then he stood up and he said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone and guess what from the oldest to the youngest they started dropping us and walking away because even though they caught her in sin he caught them with the rocks and he said I'm going to shut the mouth of all your accusers and he picked up her face and said honey where are those that are accused you neither do I accuse you go and sin no more Come on, if he's ever shut the mouth of the devil in your life, praise him. Shh. No praise today. No praise. No praise, no shh. Shh, I hear, I hear something. I hear another stone. He's saying something. What are you saying? Praise him because he brings dead things back to life. What? Tell us your story. Well, one day they brought this man that they had just crucified and they laid him in a tomb and they took me and they rolled me in front of the mouth of that tomb and then they put armed guards out in front of me to guard the body of a dead man and I thought that's kind of silly. Why are you guarding a man who's dead? And one day went by and nothing happened and a second day went by and nothing happened. But on the third day, I looked up and I saw someone coming from the heavens and the garments were like lightning. And this man, that it, it had taken an army of soldiers to roll me in front of the mouth of this tomb, but it only took one man to push me out of the way of this tomb. And when he did, something started moving on the inside. And I saw that man who was dead get back up again. I'm here to tell you, he's a God who can bring dead things back to life. And I saw that man come out and he said, behold, I am he which was dead, but now I am alive forevermore. Now, Mr. Stone, that's a great story, but I got a problem with your story. Here's my problem. You see, this, this Jesus that you're talking about, that they moved the stones so he could get out, this Jesus, I can't figure out why they had to move you because later on it says that he was just able to walk through walls. So if he has the ability to walk through walls, how come he didn't just walk through you? Why did the angel have to move you out of the way so he could get out? And I hear the stone saying, he didn't move me so that he could get out. He moved me so that you could get in. Wasn't there a body in here? But I see his clothes rumpled up on the side and his face napkin folded neatly in the corner. And then I hear Paul say, the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ back from the dead is the same spirit that now lives on the inside of each and every one of you. Somebody praise him because he's a God who brings dead things back to life. Help me if he's ever pre-
provided, praise him. If he's bigger, praise him. If he's ever shut the mouth of your enemies, praise him. If he's ever brought anything dead back to life in your life,